Hegel, Philosophy of Mind, Chapter 7, The First Subdivision of Logic, The Doctrine of Being. Encyclopedia, Section 84. Being is the notion implicit only. Its special forms have the predicate is. When they are distinguished, they are each of them an other, and the shape which dialectic takes in them, in essence, their further specialization, is a passing over into another. This further determination or specialization is at once a forth putting and in that way a disengaging of the notion implicit in being, and at the same time the withdrawing of being inwards, it's sinking deeper into itself. Thus, the explication of the notion in the sphere of being does two things. It brings out the totality of being, and it abolishes the immediacy of being, or the form of being as such. Being itself and the special sub encyclopedia section 85 being itself and the special subcategories of it which follow, as well as those of logic in general, may be looked upon as definitions of the absolute or metaphysical definitions of God. At least the first and third categories in every triad may. The first, where the thought form of the triad is formulated in its simplicity, and the third, being the return from differentiation of a simple self-reference. For a metaphysical definition of God is the expression of his nature in thoughts as such, and logic embraces all thoughts so long as they continue in the thought form. The second subcategory in each triad, where the grade of thought is in its differentiation, gives, on the other hand, a definition of the finite. The objection to the form of definition is that it implies a something in the mind's eye on which these predicates may fasten. Thus, even the absolute, though it purports to express God in the style and character of thought, in comparison with its predicate, which really and distinctly expresses in thought what the subject does not is as yet only an inchoate pretended thought the indeterminate subject of predicates yet to come the thought which is here the matter of sole importance is contained only in the predicate and hence the propositional form like the said subject vis-a-vis -vis the absolute is the mere superfluidity uh, see for up is the mere is the thought which is here the matter of sole importance is contained only in the predicate and hence the propositional form like the said subject vis-a-vis -vis the absolute is mere superfluidity see for reference encyclopedia section 31 and below on the judgment each of the three spheres of the logical idea proves to be a systematic whole of thought terms and a phase of the absolute. This is the case with being, containing the three grades of quality, quantity, and measure. Quality is, the, in the first place, the character identical with being, so identical that a thing ceases to be what it is if it loses its quality. Quantity, on the contrary, is the character external to being and does not affect the being at all. Thus, ergo, a house remains what it is, whether it be greater or smaller, and red remains red, whether it be brighter or darker. Measure the third grade of being, which is the unity of the first two, is a qualitative quantity. All things have their measure in essence, the quantitative terms of their existence. Their being so or so great does not matter within certain limits, but when these limits are exceeded by an additional, more or less, the things cease. 
the things cease to be what they were. From measure follows the advance to the second subdivision of the idea, essence. The three forms of being here, the three forms of being here mentioned, just because they are the first, are also the poorest, in essence, the most abstract, immediate, sensible consciousness, in so far as it simultaneously includes an intellectual element, is especially restricted to the abstract categories of quality and quantity. The sensuous consciousness is, in ordinary estimation, the most concrete and thus also the richest. But that is only true as regards materials, whereas in reference to the thought it contains, it is really the poorest and most abstract. Hegel, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Section 1, Logic, The Science of the Idea in and for Itself, Chapter 7, First Subdivision of Logic, The Doctrine of Being, Quasi-Subdivision A, Quality, Subsection A, Being. Encyclopedia Section 86 Pure Being Makes the Beginning because it is on one hand pure thought, and on the other immediacy itself, simple and indeterminate, and the first beginning cannot be mediated by anything or be further determined. All doubts and admonitions which might be brought against be beginning, the science with the abstract empty being, will disappear if we only perceive what a beginning naturally implies. It is possible to define being as I equals I, as absolute indifference, or identity, and so on. Where it is felt necessary to begin either with what is absolutely certain, in essence the certainty of oneself, or with a definition or intuition of the absolute truth, these and other forms of the kind may be looked on as if they must be the first. But each of these forms contains a mediation and hence cannot be the real first, for all mediation implies advance made from a first on to a second and proceeding from something different. If I equals I, or even the intellectual intuition, are really taken to mean no more than the first. They are in this mere immediacy identical with being, while conversely, pure being, if abstract no longer, but including in it mediation, is pure thought or intuition. If we enunciate being as a predicate of the absolute, we get the first definition of the latter. The absolute is being, this is, in thought, the absolutely initial definition, the most abstract and stinted. It is the definition given by the Eleatics, but at the same time is also the well-known definition of God as the sum of all realities. It means, in short, that we are to set aside that limitation which is in every reality, so that God shall be only the real in all reality, the superlatively real. Or, if we reject reality as implying a reflection, we get a mere immediate or unreflected statement of the same thing, which Jacobi says that the God of Spinoza is the principium of being in all existence. Encyclopedia section 86, in for section 1, when thinking is to begin, we have nothing but thought in its nearest indeterminateness, for we cannot determine unless there is both one and another, and in the beginning there is yet no other. The indeterminate as we have, the indeterminate as we here have it, is the blank we begin with, not a featureless not a featurelessness reached by abstraction, 
not the elimination of all character, but the original featurelessness, which precedes all definite character and is the very first of all. And this we call being. It is not to be felt or perceived by sense or pictured in imagination. It is only in merely thought, and as such it forms the beginning. Essence also is indeterminate, for, but in another sense it has traversed the process of mediation and contains implicit the determination it has absorbed. Encyclopedia section 86, in for section 2. In the history of philosophy, the different stages of the logical idea assume the shape of successive systems, each based on a particular definition of the absolute. As the logical idea is seen to unfold itself in a process from the abstract to the concrete, so in the history of philosophy, the earliest systems are the most abstract and thus at the same time the poorest. The relation to of the earlier to the latter systems of philosophy is much like the relation of the corresponding stages of the logical idea. In other words, the earlier are preserved in the latter, but subordinated and submerged. This is the true meaning of a much misunderstood phenomenon in the history of philosophy, the refutation of one system by another, of an earlier by a later. Most commonly, the refutation is taken in a purely negative sense to mean that the system refuted has ceased to count for anything, has been set aside and done for. Were it so, the history of philosophy would be of all studies most saddening, displaying, as it does, the refutation of every system which time has brought forth. Now, although it may be admitted that every philosophy has been refuted, it must be in an equal degree maintained that no philosophy has been refuted, nay, or can be refuted, and that in two ways. For first, every philosophy that deserves the name always embodies the idea, and secondly, every system represents one particular factor or a particular stage in the evolution of the idea. The refutation of a philosophy, therefore, only means that its barriers are crossed and its special principle reduced to a factor in the completer principle that follows. Thus, the history of philosophy, in its true meaning, deals not with a past, but with an eternal and veritable present, and, in its results, resembles not a museum of the aberrations of the human intellect, but a pantheon of godlike figures. These figures of gods are the various stages of the idea, as they come forward one after another in dialectical development. To the historian of philosophy, it belongs to. To the historian of philosophy, it belongs to point out more precisely how far the gradual evolution of his theme coincides with, or swerves from, the dialectical unfolding of the pure logical idea. It is sufficient to mention here that logic begins where the proper history of philosophy begins. Philosophy began in the Eleatic school, especially with Parmenides. Parmenides, who conceives the absolute as being, says that being alone is and nothing is not. Such was the true starting point of philosophy, which is always knowledge by thought. And here, for the first time, we find pure thought seized and made an object to itself. Being alone is, and nothing is not. Men indeed thought from men indeed thought from the beginning, for thus only were they distinguished from the animals, but thousands of years had to elapse before they came to apprehend thought in its purity, and to see in it the true objective. The Eleatics are celebrated as daring thinkers, but this nominal admiration is often accompanied by the remark that they went too far. When they made being alone true and denied the truth of every other object of consciousness, we must go further than mere being. It is true, and yet it is absurd to speak of the other contents of our consciousness 
as somewhat, as it were, outside and beside being, or to say that there are other things as well as being. The true state of the case is rather as follows. Being as being is nothing fixed or ultimate. It yields to dialectic and sinks into its opposite, which also taken immediately is nothing. After all, the point is that being is the first pure thought. Whatever else you may begin with, the I equals I, the absolute indifference, or God himself, you begin with a figure of materialized conception, not a product of thought, and that so far as its thought content, and that so far as its thought content is concerned, such beginning is merely being. Encyclopedia section 87. But this mere being, as it is mere abstraction, is therefore the absolutely negative, which in a similar immediate aspect is just nothing. Encyclopedia section 87, in for section 1. Hence was derived the second definition of the absolute. The absolute is the not. In fact, this definition is implied in saying that the thing in itself is the indeterminate, utterly without form and so without content, or in saying that God is only the supreme being and nothing more, for this is really declaring him to be the same negativity as above, the nothing which the Buddhists make the universal principle, as well as the final aim and goal of everything, is the same abstraction. Encyclopedia section 87, and for section 2, if the opposition in thought is stated in this immediacy as being and nothing, the shock of its nullity is too great not to stimulate the attempt to fix being and secure it against the transition into nothing. With this intent, reflection has recourse to the plan of discovering some fixed predicate for being, to mark it off from nothing. Thus we find being identified with what persists amid all change, with matter susceptible of innumerable determinations, or even unreflectingly with a single existence, any chance object of the senses or of the mind. But every additional and more concrete characterization causes being to lose that integrity and simplicity it has in the beginning. Only in and by virtue of this mere generality is it nothing, something inexpressible, whereof the distinction from nothing is a mere intention or meaning. All that is wanted is to realize that these beginnings are nothing, but these empty abstractions, one as empty as the other, the instinct that induces us to attach to a settled import to being, or to both, is the very necessity which leads to the unward movement of being and nothing, and gives them a true or concrete significance. This advance is the logical deduction, and the movement of thought exhibited in the sequel, the reflection which finds a profounder connotation for being and nothing is nothing but logical thought through which such connotation is evolved, not, however, in an accidental, but a necessary way. Every signification, therefore, in which they afterwards appear, is only a more precise specification and truer definition of the absolute. And when that is done, the mere abstract being and nothing are replaced by a concrete in which both these elements form an organic part the supreme form of thought the supreme form of naught as a separate principle would be freedom the supreme form of naught as a separate principle would be freedom but freedom is negativity in that stage when it sinks self absorbed to supreme intensity and is itself an affirmation and even absolute affirmation the distinction between being and not is, in the first place, only implicit and not yet actually made. They only ought to be distinguished. 
A distinction, of course, implies two things, in that one of them possesses an attribute which is not found in the other, but however is an absolute absence of attributes, and so is not. Hence, the distinction between the two is only meant to be, it is a quite nominal distinction, which is at the same time no distinction. In all other cases of difference, there is some common point which comprehends both things. Suppose, ergo, we speak of two different species. The genus forms a common ground for both, but in the case of mere being and nothing, distinction is without a bottom to stand upon, hence there can be no distinction, both determinations being the same bottomlessness. If it reply that being and nothing are both of them thoughts, so that thought may be reckoned common ground, the objector forgets that being is not a particular or definite thought, and hence, being quite indeterminate, is a thought not to be distinguished from nothing. It is natural, too, for us to represent being as absolute riches, and nothing as absolute poverty. But if when we view the whole world, we can only say that everything is and nothing more. We are neglecting all speciality, and instead of absolute plenitude, we have absolute emptiness. The same stricture is applicable to those who define God to be mere being. A definition not a whit better than that of the Buddhists, who make God to be not, and who from that principle draw the further conclusion that self-annihilation is the means by which man becomes God. Encyclopedia Section 88 Nothing, if it be thus immediate and equal to itself, is also conversely the same as beingness. Let's stop and take that sentence piece by piece. You may have heard me say, nothing, if it be thus immediate and equal to itself, is also conversely the same as being is, meaning that nothing and being are not the same. This isn't what it says. Right before, <clears throat> right before and you'll find out later uh, if you haven't already listened to this uh, science of mind, or the philosophy of mind. Uh, there is a lot of Buddhist and Hindu undertones to this entire work. And at this point in German history, uh, Buddhism, at least as it relates to the Aryan or Iranian or Assyrian movement out of India and Iran across what is now modern day Syria, uh, through the Balkans and into Germany, uh, there has been some holding on to aspects of Buddhism, uh, which came from northern India. Uh, so it seems that there's a critique here when there isn't. Uh, basically, before this part, it says, but if when we view the whole world, we can only say that everything is and nothing more we are neglecting all speciality, and instead of absolute plenitude, we have absolute emptiness. Now, absolute plenitude is not necessarily a positive thing, and absolute emptiness is not necessarily a negative thing, except in mathematical terms. The same stricture is applicable to those who define God to be mere being, a play on words, a mere is an ocean dwelling being, and the mere being being discussed here is Neptune, a definition not a whit better than that of the Buddhists, who make God to be not, and who from and not being uh, another word uh, for nirvana. So who make God to be nirvana. But again, in the, the dialectic here, which we've discussed, uh, hides that. And who from that principle draw the further conclusion 
that self-annihilation is the means by which man becomes God. What type of God? Uh, the absolute God? Possibly. <laughs> At some point in the history of all mankind, if we exist beyond this planet in the universe, maybe there was a man who through self-annihilation became the absolute God. However, in this case, uh, the word God should be replaced for uh, possibly bodhisattva, because uh, there are other types of entities uh, that are known as gods within the Buddhist pantheon. But a bodhisattva is one within the um, who has finished the theoretic process of Buddhism and adopted Mahayanaism, which says that when one reaches nirvana, uh, you decide not to become annihilated, but you wait until, let's say, a certain cohort of people uh, reach that same realization, and then you accept your annihilation. Uh, and it is possible for that person to become a bodhisattva, or that's the, the bodhisattva's old, that's what they become. Um, and it's a type of good God. Not all gods, at least in tradition, are good. And even the God of the Old Testament, the God of uh, the Hebrew scriptures and Aramaic scriptures, he was called good God, uh, especially for those he loved, but he was considered uh, a terror uh, for those who opposed him, even sometimes his chosen people. So Bodhisattva is a good God. So again, what Hegel is doing here uh, through the pen of William Wallace is explaining the different types of high beings that we have. The Lama, the, the person who has reached Nirvana, the Bodhisattva, who in the case of current days, uh, most of you would look to uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who is the 14th uh, incarnation of the Bodhisattva of Mercy, um, I and my cultural heritage look towards Japan, uh, to uh, the Emperor of Japan, bless him, uh, who is also a Bodhisattva, uh, who may represent uh, Shiva, uh, and others, again, going back to my heritage uh, in Mongolia, uh, we would look to Avalokiteshvara, uh, a, a Lama who is there as well. So these are all people who can hold the term God, uh, and you would say, well, he could be, uh, but uh, Hegel goes on, and again, we're developing logic here, but later in the uh, Phenomenology of Mind, uh, he discusses more explicitly uh, what mind is and what thought is and how God is, uh, how God is and God is thought. Um, versus something that you can see. Uh, but sometimes thought becomes form and you, you run into a loop there. Uh, so these are ways to go, uh, go on. Here in Encyclopedia Section 88, nothing does it mean he's saying, it's not a statement, nothing about this makes any sense. No, nothing. A term, a reality, nothing is the only thing which makes sense. So instead of hearing Encyclopedia Section 88 as nothing, if anything at all is the is opposite of being, no, he's saying nothing, not uh, a reality. The, the number zero, which in Arabic is called sifr, and sifr. Uh, S-I-F-R, if you want, is the word we have for cipher. And the zero on the number line, as it goes zero and then achieves one, or zero and achieves negative one, zero is a reality. It's, and this is a uh, platonic, uh, peripathetic, we would say, text. And so numbers and math are our key here. And the math you need to know is the great secret, which is zero, is cipher, is a cipher. What is between, what's unique about zero? Zero marks the point 
between zero and the number one, uh, there is an infinity of permutations, uh, all the way down to the plate constant, uh, which is just a bit be beyond zero, to a whole, a reality, one, even the whole universe. Um, from zero to negative one, there seems to be another infinity, uh, which is one I, I don't believe I can explain uh, in detail. Uh, so nothing, zero, sifr, um, is a reality. And nothing, going back to Encyclopedia section 88, nothing, sifr, zero, not. If it be thus immediate and equal to itself, is con also conversely the same as being is. So removing the, the uh, phrase within the commas here, nothing is also conversely the same as being is. The truth of being and of nothing zero, cipher, cipher, is accordingly the unity of the two, and this unity is becoming. Encyclopedia section 88, and for section 1, the proposition that being and nothing is the same seems so paradoxical to the imagination or understanding that it is perhaps taken for a joke. And indeed, it is one of the hardest things thought except. And indeed, it is one of the hardest things thought expects itself to do. The proposition that being and nothing is the same seems so paradoxical to the imagination or understanding that it is perhaps taken for a joke. And indeed, it is one of the hardest things thought expects itself to do. For being and nothing exhibit the fundamental contrast in all its immediacy. That is, without the one term being invested with any attribute which would involve its connection with the other, this attribute, however, as the above paragraph points out, is implicit in them, the attribute which is just the same in both. So far, the deduction of their unity is completely analytical. Indeed, the whole progress of philosophizing, in every case, if it be methodical or methodical, indeed, the whole process of philosophizing, in every case, if it be methodical, that is to say, a necessary progress, merely renders explicit what is implicit in a notion. It is as correct, however, as saying that being and nothing are altogether different as to assert their unity. The one is not what the other is. But since the distinction has not at this point assumed definite shape, being and nothing are still the immediate. It is in the way that they have it, nothing. It is in the way that they have it, something unutterable which we merely mean. Encyclopedia section 88, infra section 2. No great expenditure of wit is needed to make fun of the maxim that being and nothing are the same, or rather to adduce absurdities which, it is erroneously asserted, are the consequences and illustrations of that maxim. If being and not are identical, say these objectors, it follows that it makes no difference whether my home, my property, the air I breathe, this city, the sun, the law, mind, God, are or are not. Now, in some of these cases, the objectors foist in private aims, the utility a thing has for me, and then ask whether it be all the same to me if the thing exists and if it do not. For that matter, indeed, the teaching of philosophy is precisely what frees a man 
or what frees mankind from the endless crowd of finite aims and intentions, by making him so insensible to them that their existence or non-existence is to him a matter of indifference. But it is never to be forgotten that, once mentioned something substantial, and you thereby create a connection with other existences and other purposes which are ex hypothesis worth having. And on such hypothesis, it comes to depend whether that being and not being of a determinate subject are the same or not. A substantial distinction is in these cases secretly substituted for the empty distinction of being and not. In others of the cases referred to, it is virtually absolute existences and vital ideas and aims, which are placed under the mere category of being or not being. But there is more to be said of these concrete objects than that they merely are or are not. Barren abstractions like being and nothing, the initial categories which, for that reason, are the scantiest anywhere to be found, are utterly inadequate to, to the nature of these objects. Substantial truth is something far above these abstractions and their oppositions, and always when a concrete existence is disguised under the name of being and not being, empty-headedness makes its usual mistake of speaking about and having in the mind an image of something else than what is in question, and in this place the question is about abstract being and nothing. Encyclopedia section 88 and for section 3, it may perhaps be said that nobody can form a notion of the unity of being and not. As for that, the notion of the unity is stated in the sections preceding, and that is all. Apprehend that, and you have comprehended this unity. What the objector really means by comprehension, by a notion, is more than his language properly implies. He wants a richer and more complex state of mind, a pictorial conception which will propound the notion as a concrete case, and one more familiar to the ordinary operation of thought, and one more familiar to the ordinary operations of thought. And so long as incomprehensibility means only the want of habituation for the effort needed to grasp an abstract thought, free from all sensuous admixture, and to seize a speculative truth, the reply to the criticism is that philosophical knowledge is undoubtedly distinct in kind from the mode of knowledge best known in common life, as well as from that which reigns in the other sciences. But if to have no notion merely means that we cannot represent in imagination the oneness of being and not, the statement is far from being true. For every one has countless ways of envisaging this unity. To say that we have no such conception can only mean that in none of these images do we recognize the notion in question and that we are not aware that they exemplify it. The readiest example of it is becoming. Everyone has a material Everyone has a mental idea of becoming and will even allow that it is one idea. He will further allow that when it is analyzed, it involves the attribute of being and also what is the very reverse of being vis-a-vis -vis nothing, and that these two attributes lie undivided in the one idea, so that becoming is the unity of being and nothing. Another tolerably plain example is a beginning. In its beginning, the thing is not yet, but it is more than merely nothing, for its being is already in the beginning. Being, beginning is itself a case of becoming. Only the former term is employed with an eye to the further advance. 
if we were to adapt logic to the more usual method of the sciences, we might start with the representation of a beginning as abstractly thought or with beginning as such, and then analyze this representation, and perhaps people would more readily admit, as a result of this analysis, that being and nothing present themselves as undivided in unity. Encyclopedia section 88, and for section 4, it remains to note that such phrases as being and nothing are the same, or the unity of being and nothing, like all other such unities, that of subject and object, and others give rise to reasonable objection. They must represent the facts by giving an exclusive prominence to the unity and leaving the difference which undoubtedly exists in it because it is being and nothing, for example, the unity of which is declared without any express mention or notice. It accordingly seems as if the diversity had been unduly put out of court and neglected. The fact is no speculative principle can be correctly expressed by any such propositional form, for the unity has to be conceived in the diversity, which is all the while present and explicit. To become is the true expression for the resultant of to be and not to be, it is the unity of the two, but not only is it the unity, it is also inherent unrest, the unity, the unity, which is no more reference to self and therefore without movement, but which through the diversity of being and nothing that is in it is at war within itself, the terminate being on the other hand, is this unity, or becoming in this form of unity, hence all that is there and so is one-sided and finite. Determinate being, on the other hand, is this unity, or becoming in this form of unity, hence all that is there and so is one-sided and finite. The opposition between the two factors seems to have vanished. It is only implied in the unity. It is not explicitly put in it. Encyclopedia section 88, infra section 5. The maxim of becoming, that being is the passage into naught and not the passage into being, is controverted by the maxim of pantheism, the doctrine of the eternity of matter, that from nothing comes nothing, and that something can only come out of something. The ancients saw plainly that the maxim from nothing comes nothing, from something, something really abolishes becoming. For what it comes from and what it becomes are one and the same. Thus explained, the proposition is the maxim of abstract identity as upheld by understanding. What is abstract identity upheld by understanding? That nothing is a word, is a term, is a token, and it has a reference point. Nothing refers to, at this point in our understanding of physics, the Planck constant, the smallest unit that there could ever be. And from nothing, the Planck constant, Sifr itself, becoming is realized. If you are just the Planck constant, blessed, if you are just the Higgs boson, thank you, before you become something, before you are, you need more of yourself added to yourself giving yourself mass, giving yourself uh, velocity, and that nothing is. And then when it is equal to itself or multiplied by itself, it actually builds and creates the entire unity. And the unity is our universe. Until we can really know what the multiverse is, uh, it is difficult to then identify anything beyond our universe. But one day we may be able to, and then it becomes a unit, a Planck constant, very likely our universe, uh, in the number line of the multiverse.
But within this unity, within this universe, there is our Planck constant, the smallest available unit that is measurable by science. And there is the Higgs boson, which, as far as we know, gives that Planck constant its mass. So from nothing comes something. Uh, now, if you want to go to absolute zero, uh, this is a temperature. Uh, get to absolute zero, and then uh, from there, you warm up, and all types of things do occur. So absolute zero for those who are very strict uh, about the nature of the, of the divine reality uh, is a temperature. And then from there, you become warmer. Thus explain the proposition is the maximum of abstract identity as upheld by the understanding. It cannot but seem strange, therefore, to hear such maxims as, out of nothing comes nothing, out of something comes something, calmly taught in these days, without the teacher being in the least aware that they are the basis of pantheism, and even without his knowing that the ancients have exhausted all that is to be said about them. So where did Doctor of Law, Christopher Robert Neal, of the Athabascan Ainu people, and the Irish and the Jews, get all that he just told you? Did he read Hegel and then all of a sudden become aware of what to say just by reading through it? As I always thought my teachers did, they would read a text and then have something tremendous to say about it, which I couldn't find easily. I believe this text here, because the tradition requires it to be a, at least a summation or a translation of something older, as William Wallace has translated Hegel's. Uh, German, I believe this text comes from a text from a Spanish uh, mystic uh, whose name was uh, Muhiddin ibn al Arabi. Uh, literally, uh, Muhiddin means the vivifier or he who causes uh, from absolute zero uh, to warmth, uh, which produces uh, the vivifier of the faith. Um, the son of a well-spoken person, uh, also of an Arab, uh, from very north in Spain, from Arthea. Uh, his family moved to Sevilla in around the year uh, 1100, maybe a little bit later than that, and they took up some rulership. Uh, they, some of them had come over from Syria, where he returned, uh, some from Mecca, Medina, uh, some from the Americas, uh, but ultimately, uh, and his current family, is the Spanish royal house, and of course all their relatives, um, but specifically the emeritus king of Spain, uh, His Majesty Juan Carlos, uh, whose last name is Orabi, or if not Arabi, or Wayne. Uh, so this is their family. And so as I read this text, which comes from the 1800s, written probably to a king, a king who was going to explore a new world and set up a constitution, or well, around the time this was written, um, or at least assists with one, with his English adversaries and companions, and also his family. I believe this text is from an older text called the Futuhata Mekia, uh, which is the, um, the realizations or openings which occurred in Mecca uh, by the same author, Ibn al-Arabi, which uh, he puts together in a very similar format uh, to discuss different items and concerns. Um, so, I studied a, a different text in some of the other works of this author, uh, Ibn al-Arabi, uh, with scholars who themselves have what are called permissions or ijazat uh, to teach it, or at least one in particular, um, and all he studied with. So I have a background in this uh, understanding, and when I, I, I speak about it, the way I heard them speak about it, you just speak, but every so often when uh, the text itself calls you out and says, um, without the teacher being in the least aware that they are the basis of pantheism, and even without his knowing that the ancients have exhausted all that is to be said about them, the teacher. Well, of course, of course, I thought myself, 
And then I remembered uh, Sheikh Al-Akbar, uh, the greatest of those who guide, uh, the, 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 right, the righteous teacher, uh, the teacher of knowledge. And that person is only one person within a tradition that would mention Buddhism and eventually Islam uh, and Hinduism and Catholicism all at once and be from Germany uh, and write in Greek. Uh, all those things brought together reference a certain type of person, a Gnostic. And so the great teacher um, is Ibn al-Arabi uh, in, in, in our tradition. So this is who it is. And he had become the subject of pantheism for many. Um, and that just means that we need a bit more education uh, to understand uh, the Planck constant and what uh, becomes a result from it. And if they still rely on pantheism, then that's between them and uh, absolute zero or whomever else may have a concern. Returning to the text, becoming is the first concrete thought and therefore the first notion. Kum, faya kum. Whereas being and not are empty abstractions, the notion of being, therefore, of which we sometimes speak, must mean becoming, not the mere point of being, which is empty nothing, any more than nothing, which is empty being. In being, then, we have nothing, and in nothing, being. But this being, which does not lose itself in nothing, is becoming. Nor must we omit the distinction while we emphasize the unity of becoming. Without that distinction, we should once more return to abstract being. Becoming is the only explicit statement of what being is, and it's true. We often hear it maintained that thought is opposed to being. Now, in the face of such a statement, our first question ought to be, what is meant by being? If we understand being as it is defined by reflection, all that we can say of it is that it is what is wholly identical and affirmative. And if we then look at thought, it cannot escape us that thought also is at least what is absolutely identical with itself. Both I, therefore, being as well as thought, have the same attribute. This identity of being and thought is not, however, to be I taken in a concrete sense, as if we could say that a stone, so far as it has being, is the same as a thinking man. A concrete being is always very different from the abstract category as such. This is a reference to the, again, within the Gnostic tradition, uh, or the, the tradition of metaphysics, the, the, the tradition, of elitism. So because you and I share a category does not mean that you or I are as useful as each other. So a concrete thing is always very different from the abstract category as such. And in the case of being, we are speaking of nothing concrete. For being is the utterly abstract, so far then the question regarding the being of God, a being which is in itself concrete above all measure, is of slight importance. Whether or not you believe in God, has nothing to do with a logical argument about God, except that it may make it easier uh, to accept it later. If the argument is that God is a being which is in itself concrete above all measure, then it is of importance that you understand what this God is. Is it a bodhisattva? Is it the universe? Is it a planet? Is it a fish? Is it a jellyfish? Is it a whale? Whatever it is, 
it is worth finding out about. So you can know your place vis-a-vis -vis it, or so you can just know what this thing is we're talking about. We're, we're talking about an entity uh, which either provides good or provides some pause when it isn't recognized. It's like the double slit test, uh, where to see if light, when it is observed, uh, goes through two slits, and when it's not observed, it goes through one. Light and God have been synonymous in language for a long time. Why is it that when we observe light, it acts differently than when we don't observe it? For this reason, for the reasons that we learn about it, that we care about that question, is the reason why we care about God. What happens when you don't look at God? What happens when you do? Being that God and light have been synonymous for many ages, even the name Christ, uh, uh, Jesu, Cristo, uh, is that the electrical substance came, Jesu, and illuminated us, Cristo. Uh, it is a derivative of the name Zeus. Um, so this is. This is current, then, that when we say Jesus Christ, maybe it was the man who lived 2,000 years ago. Maybe his name is a token, a reference point for us to remember uh, this electrical substance which comes and illuminates us or gives us life. There is something that if we observe it, acts differently than when we don't observe it. And the difference in the two is meaningful. And so we continue to provide, uh, we being the tradition, a logical argument for this light. As the first concrete thought term, being is the first adequate vehicle of truth. In the history of philosophy, this stage of the logical idea finds its analog in the system of Heraclitus. When Heraclitus says, all is flowing, he enunciates becoming as the fundamental feature of all existence, whereas the Eleatics, as already remarked, saw the only truth in being, rigid, processless being. Glancing at the principle of the Eleatics, Heraclitus then goes on to say, being no more is than not being, a statement expressing the negativity of abstract being and its identity with not being, as made explicit in becoming, both abstractions being alike untenable. This may be looked at as an instance of the real refutation of one system by another. To refute a philosophy is to exhibit the dialectical movement in its principle, and thus reduce it to a constituent member of a higher concrete form of the idea. Even becoming, however, taken at its best on its own ground, is an extremely poor term. It needs to grow in depth and weight of meaning. Such deepened force we find, ergo, in life. Life is a becoming. But that is not enough to exhaust the notion of life. A still higher form is found in mind. Here too is becoming, but richer and more intensive than mere logical becoming. The elements whose unity constitutes, whose unity constitutes mind, the elements whose unity constitutes mind, are not the bare abstracts of being and of not, but the system of the logical idea and of nature. As divine Pythagoras said, there is geometry and the humming of the strings. 
and there is music in the space between the spheres. In this case, the elements are the geometry, or at least become from the geometry of the humming strings of light. And the mind itself exists in the space between the spheres, whether those be your ears or be the large planets between and between those large planets. So this is a statement back to the uh, Pythagorean system and the platonic solids. If you find the platonic solids in research, you will find that they also represent the five elements, uh, earth, ether, water, fire, and air. And you'll learn how they take shapes and interact with each other and form all of the things which become they are being and which become the universe. And they are being in relative uh, to the humming strings of light. Hegel, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Section 1, Logic, The Science of the Idea in and for Itself, Chapter 7, First Subdivision of Logic, The Doctrine of Being, Quasi-Subdivision A, Quality, Subsection B, Being, Determinate. Encyclopedia Section 89. In becoming the being, which is one with nothing, and the nothing, which is one with being, are only vanishing factors. They are, and they are not. Thus, by its inherent contradiction, becoming collapses into the unity in which the two elements are absorbed. This results in, accordingly, being determinate, being there, and so. This can also be seen in chemistry as the process of creating an ion. When an electron leaves a molecule, you have a different state of the electron. Also, when or I should say, when an electron leaves an atom, you have a different state of the atom. It also may allow uh, the atoms to combine uniquely. Uh, these atoms in combination, these elements in combination, are being and becoming. They collapse themselves into the unity. So you can think about this in a chemistry term or in a hyperphilosophy term as well about marriage. Uh, when two people, uh, cleave themselves from their parents and join to create a new household, as we learn in, uh, I think, the Book of Ruth or in another part of the uh, Bible. Uh, this is another type of uh, being determinate. In this first example, we must call to mind once for all what was stated in Encyclopedia Section 82 and in the note there. So I I'm going to go back to Encyclopedia Section 82 uh, in summary and read it. Summary of Encyclopedia Section 82 and the infrasections or notes. Subsection Gamma, the speculative stage or stage of positive reason apprehends the unity of terms, propositions, in their opposition, the affirmative, which is involved in their disintegration and in their transition. In for section one, the result of dialectic is positive because it has a definite content or because its result is not empty and abstract nothing, but the negation of certain specific propositions which are contained in the result. For the very reason that it is a resultant is 
for the very reason that it is a resultant and not an immediate nothing. And for section two, it follows from this that the reasonable result, though it be only a thought and abstract, is a concrete, being not a plain formal unity, but a unity of distinct propositions. Bare abstractions or formal thoughts are therefore no business of philosophy. Bare abstractions or formal thoughts are therefore no business of philosophy, which has to deal only with concrete thoughts. Uh, what does formal thought mean? Uh, formal thought is something that comes from etiquette. If you are standing before a king, it is inappropriate to turn your back to him and speak to a friend, especially while you have the floor. However, in philosophy, even a political philosophy, there may be a reason to do so, and the interruption. of the formality of the etiquette uh, is something for, for, has a concrete reality to it. There's a concrete reason why you're doing it according to your philosophy. So knowing the etiquette and then breaking it for a concrete reason, this is philosophy. Or knowing the etiquette and obeying it, but for the philosophy, for a different philosophical reason, say your philosophy from a political standpoint is to magnify royalty, uh, you may actually have your friend tap you on the shoulder and try to get your attention, and you reach back and pressing your hand against his chest, say, not now, but without turning behind you. So the king sees that you're obeying uh, etiquette, and you're being kind to your friend, who may be there for another important reason. So these are ways in which you make a definite intention for your actions uh, based on a philosophy, and you don't get caught up in formal thoughts. Uh, a bare abstraction is saying, isn't it strange that the floors are gray? I don't like gray floors. The next thing to make it a philosophy is, why don't you like gray floors, I may ask, and then you may tell me. But I already assume, since you didn't begin by saying, vibrant colors bring joy to people. Look how gray the floors are. Look how gray the floors are. I don't like gray floors. Well, this is a funeral home, and some traditions require mourning. I know that's more that's more of a, a etiquette reason than a philosophy, but I also take your theories into account. And if you're saying we should paint the colors brighter so the mourners don't suffer as much after they leave, I'll take that into consideration. All right, uh, infra section three of Encyclopedia section eighty-two, subsection which is also subsection gamma. The logic of mere understanding is involved in speculative logic and can at will be elicited from it by the simple process of omitting the dialectical and reasonable element. When that is done, it becomes what the common logic is, a descriptive collection of sundry thought forms and rules which, finite though they are, are taken to be something infinite. What is infrasection three? If you spent your whole life in a formal setting, in a palace, uh, in a religious community, uh, within a political dynasty, uh, a democratic political dynasty, for instance, or, or, or even a, a, a tyranny, as they have in Greek, which we now call dictatorships, if you spend your time in that environment, you learn uh, formalities. 
etiquettes, ways to speak and what to say and what not to say, then if you are safely sent out into the world around, uh, outside the palace, outside the political mansion, or away on uh, a room swinger from the, the religious community, you will find yourself amongst people who won't express uh, an argument with what you are or what you're doing because they don't really know what it is. And it won't seem reasonable what they're up to, but they also don't have the same abilities to manifest certain thoughts as you. They haven't read this or understand it. And so you'll be around uh, a different process of understanding speculative logic. I bet they're doing that because you're here. So for instance, uh, in the news now, uh, there's a lot of discussion about the Supreme Court of the United States allowing uh, certain types of handguns to be concealed uh, in places where traditionally they've prevented this from happening because of a history of violence or, or concern or deterrence, and maybe there's not a lot of hunting. And within the halls of the law, we discuss what the Constitution says, how we interpret it, how it's been interpreted before, and how it might be interpreted in the future. Uh, we speak to certain jurists, especially on the Supreme Court, in a particular way, um, understanding that in some point in our career, we ourselves are our firm, or maybe someone as a close companion may go before the court and make an argument, and they, we don't want to harm uh, our chances at that point. We represent. 3% of the American population and far less percent of the world population, those who are able to make these constitutional arguments because they've gone to law school. Now, um, if a lawyer walks out into the world and he finds everyone making speculative arguments, just, I don't think this is right. People shouldn't be able to walk around with handguns uh, or they should be able to or maybe if they registered this way or if they were this age, people are speculating based on their understanding, on their feelings, on their reality about what they wish were true. And what is the job of a logical thinker in that respect? You can offer, well, the Constitution says uh, in the Second Amendment that you have a right to form a militia, an armed militia, and it doesn't tell you what type of armaments that they might use. You can say that the whole country has been stable, and according to us, the most stable democracy uh, since Athens, maybe even longer, because of our reliance on the Constitution and our, our three-part government. And so we should probably just go with it. But you can also say, if you truly don't like what you're hearing, as I hear from your speculative logic, and you want your logic to be true, you can amend the Constitution. And here are the things that you would amend in the Constitution to make it what you feel should be true. Otherwise, you'll walk around, uh, the people who are using speculative logic, you will walk around hoping and wishing for something that cannot be. And if you do that enough, you can lead to a revolution. Uh, of the entire system, whereas you could have also just, uh, or a logical person could have presented another option. This is a constitution. This is a conservative interpretation of it. Uh, in general, you're going to land at this interpretation with everyone there uh, who's present on the court uh, with some minor differences. But if you want to make a change, uh, you can amend the constitution and avoid a revolution or at least a full revolution. Returning to Encyclopedia section 89. So, beginning at the beginning of this paragraph. In this first example, we must call to mind, once for all, what was stated in Encyclopedia section 82 and in the note there. The only way to secure any growth and progress in knowledge is to hold results fast in their truth. 
There is absolutely nothing whatever in which we cannot and must not point to contradictions or opposite attributes, and the abstraction made by understanding therefore means a forcible insistence on a single aspect, and a real effort to obscure and remove all consciousness of the other attribute which is involved. Whenever such contradiction then is discovered in any object or notion, the usual inference is, hence, this object is nothing. Thus, Zinu, who first showed the contradiction native to motion, concludes that there is no motion, and the ancients, who recognize origin and decease, the two species of becoming, as untrue categories, made use of the expression that the one or absolute neither arises nor perishes. Such a style of dialectic looks only at the negative aspect of its result and fails to notice what is at the same time really present, the definite result, in the present case a pure nothing, but a nothing which includes being, and in like manner a being which includes nothing. Hence, being determinate is, example one, the unity of being and nothing, in which we get rid of the immediacy in these determinations, and their contradiction vanishes in their mutual connection, the unity in which they are only constituent elements. So being, from an elemental standpoint, could be earth. Nothing, or the cause of nothing, could be fire. And instead of saying that they are ridiculous categories, we can say that being is made nothing, or earth is made uh, not by fire. And so by combining these together, knowing that they're elemental realities, uh, then from that we may get uh, smoke, uh, or form of uh, air uh, as a result of it. Uh, and so these are, and you'll also find out what the platonic solids and the elements, and the elements and the elementals, uh, that which creates the elements. Uh, you'll have fire, then you'll have heat. You'll have water, then you'll have wet. You'll have earth, and then you'll have varying solids. And now those varying solids could become liquid, could become air, and that heat could be warmth, could be extremely hot, could end up being cold, but still burning. Uh, so you'll have the sensation of heat. So this is how being in nothing in which we get rid of the immediacy in their determinations and their contradiction, vanishes. This is how being and nothing uh, get to, the, con the, the contradictions between them vanish. So when we're speaking about philosophers from 2,000 or 3,000 years ago, who were, at least in their language, the first to come up with these concepts, um, we we thank them for their thoughts, for their contradictions, for their approach, and then we move forward with examples that we have based on uh, the natural philosophy or what we know from physics. Uh, and example two, since the result is the abolition of the contradiction, it comes in the shape of a simple unity with itself. That is to say, it also is being but being with negation or determinateness, it is becoming expressly put in the form of one of its elements, vis-a-vis -vis being. What happens when you, well, if all the platonic solids were held together in a unity, a consistent unity, what we have, at least from tradition, is what's called Metatron's cube, M-E-T-A-R-O-N apostrophe S, 
cube, C-U-B-E. In Metatron's cube, you'll see the unity. And you'll also be able to see, if you know what you're looking for, the platonic solid being and becoming. Now, they are being themselves, and they're becoming other than themselves and returning to themselves again at different scales and levels. So Metatron's cube takes all the platonic solids together and to give you this idea. Uh, and it is being, and Metatron, or at least Metatron's cube, is one of the great symbols for the divine unity for God. And Metatron is a reference to uh, the patriarch uh, who comes after Adam, uh, so you have Adam, and then traditionally you move on from Cain and Abel uh, to Seth, uh, his uh, third son, called a gift from God, uh, with Eve. And then from Seth, uh, you go on to eventually come to Enoch. And Enoch was said to have uh, walked and talked with God, and he was not because God took him. Um, and so that talks about him having an elemental reality. He, he had a being, and that being moved in concert with the divine unity. And that being, called Enoch, Hanuch, was not because God took him. And God took him into a higher form, into himself. Uh, he is said to have become completely engulfed in flames and light and transfigured into a, a glorious angel with 36 wings and eyes and uh, to another self, something higher. Uh, his lower form was negated and he became something more because of an exercise in trying to understand the divine unity, walking and talking with it. And so Metatron's cube is named for that. Uh, what did he fall into? His cube is his daeth, his abyss, his abyss. Uh, and this is what he fell into. Um, and from it, he became something greater, or at least more substantial than he was. So what he was is not anymore because he has become uh, something else, uh, the scribe of heaven. So that tradition exists. Um, whether or not you need to believe it as a literal reality, we do know that Enoch lived and became greater than himself uh, by becoming uh, one of the first kings, uh, all-powerful kings or pharaohs of Egypt. Uh, so this is something that you can look into. I just asked the emperor of Japan, uh, at the moment, and may be for a long time, Narhito, uh, before he became emperor, his father, the emperor, uh, became emeritus, and the emperor Narhito went into a chamber and emerged emperor, emerged divine. So we don't know what happened. I don't know what happened in that chamber, but he became something else. Whatever he was before, it's not. He is something greater. That doesn't mean that the emeritus emperor is something less. We imagine that he's something more evolved or different as well. Uh, but his son, who is now emperor, Narhito, has become greater. Uh, and so he was, he, whoever he was before, we would say is he walked and talked with God in the form of a bodhisattva, his father, and his father took him at least to the higher point of being emperor as he is, and whoever he was before is not, because there is the emperor Narhito. And in his transition from life, he will become greater still. Uh, it's the tradition. So uh, it is very likely that the becoming emperor of Japan is akin, or if it's not the origin point of the empire of Japan, and in the kingdom of Japan has been around for thousands of years. Uh, the story of Enoch may have origins in Japan, or at least of the people of Japan, or 
it may have been adopted from this earlier tradition uh, and kept going for some time. But if you want to know more about being and becoming as Enoch did, uh, please look up the investiture of the Emperor Narjito, uh, which was filmed and seen by many people. And you can imagine a bit more of what it is uh, to be, to be, and then not to be, and become greater still. Uh, returning to the text, even our ordinary conception of becoming implies that somewhat become, even our ordinary conception of becoming implies that somewhat comes out of it. Even our ordinary conception of becoming implies that somewhat comes out of it and that becoming therefore has a result. But this conception gives rise to the question how becoming does not remain mere becoming, but has a result. The answer to this question follows from what becoming has already shown itself to be. Becoming always contains being and nothing in such a way that these two are always changing into each other and reciprocally and reciprocally cancelling each other. Thus, becoming stands before us in utter restlessness, unable, however, to maintain itself in this abstract re restlessness, for since being and nothing vanish in becoming, and that is the very notion of becoming, the latter must vanish also. Becoming is, as it were, a fire which dies out in itself when it consumes its material. The result of this process, however, is not an empty nothing, but being identical with the negation. What we call being determinate, being then and there, the primary import of which evidently is that it has become. So instead of imagining a, or imagine a large wood fire. And over it, you have a steel sword. And you heat the sword, heat the sword, heat the sword. And you begin beating it and grating it on a rock uh, to sharpen it. And again, it's glowing hot. You beat it and you grate it. And then once you put it into water, let's say a flowing river, you'll see a dross uh, come off of it as it cools down. We may want to stare at that dross and say that is what has become. If it were just the wood, we would only see effectively the ashes, which are like dross, uh, left. But when heat becomes cool, you have a sharp sword. And swords are pictorial references for thoughts and ideas, according to the tarot uh, and uh, Italian uh, pictorial philosophy. So you now have a sword. Uh, which you can then use, or you have an idea which can then pierce uh, a problem. But it may have taken uh, some sweat, some uh, heating up and cooling down. And then when you heat up, because you're so excited or you're worried about an issue, you sweat out uh, lots of toxins. And then you cool down, and hopefully you have a solution. And that solution is your sword, your sword after it's been forged and sharpened uh, and made ready is the same as this process here. Encyclopedia section 90, infra subdivision section A, infra subdivision section alpha, determinate being is being with a character or mode. <clears throat> 